I start. As we gather this morning to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, may we set aside our concerns and worries triggered by a disordered world and focus on him, our hope, our joy, our peace, our salvation. As we sing the carols, may we treasure their words of truth. As we listen to the readings, may our hearts and minds be taken back to that sacred day in history when God in Christ, for the sake of our salvation, was born to share our humanity. Let us remember before God all who rejoice with us, that multitude upon another shore and in a greater light, whose hope was in Jesus, the Word made flesh. And as our carols are sung, our prayers are offered up, and God's Word is preached, so may his hope, his joy, and his peace fill our hearts this Christmas and always. Amen. Isaiah foretells the birth of the Messiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The second reading is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and we call, be, be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. The third reading is taken from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. The birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. The fourth reading is taken from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, 
beginning at verse 8, the angel appears to the shepherds. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory Glory to to God God in in the the highest heaven, heaven, and and on on earth earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. The fifth reading is taken from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. The shepherds visit the Christ child. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Lord, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you for the wonderful message of Christmas. And we pray that it'll, it'll be clear, really clear, uh, as we look at your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, my wife and I uh, moved to Chipping Norton about five years ago. We were up in York. And one of the very exciting things has been to see David Cameron getting involved with us at the church at St. Mary's. He helps with some of the food distribution. And um, I heard this story. I don't think I've told you this story. I hope I haven't. If I have, just laugh at them at the right moment. I heard this story about a young, young boy who desperately wanted a hundred pounds. So he prayed to God for a whole week for a hundred pounds and nothing happened. So he decided to write God a letter and he addressed the letter to God UK Limited and uh, the the post office in their wisdom sent the letter to uh, Downing Street. And uh, the the, uh, Prime Minister was very touched by the boy's request so he instructed his private secretary to send the boy five pounds because he thought the boy would be delighted with that. Anyway, the boy received the five pounds and he was delighted. So he, he wrote back to God and he said this, thank you very much for the gift of money. I noticed that the letter was redirected through 10 Downing Street and as usual, they took most of it. (laughs) Now, it just goes to show that all our hopes are not realised. And uh, as you and I look back over this last year, I wonder what you would say about this year. Uh, For some of you here this morning, it's been a good year. Maybe you've had a promotion at work. Maybe you've fallen in love with someone. Maybe you've had a grandchild. My wife and I had our 18th grandchild about two months ago, I think it was. Yeah, a bit more. Uh, But some of us have been disappointed as we look back over the last year. Maybe we've lost a friend or a family member. We've lost two friends, both fairly young, fit, healthy. Both of them developed brain tumours and have left a wife and family behind. Maybe you've suffered from ill health this year, or maybe a broken relationship. Uh, Maybe there are some of you here who've lost your job. And you would say, as you look back over this year, it's been a bad year for me, not a good year. But it's probably true to say that most of us 
are feeling tired and maybe some of us are even feeling a little bit worn out physically, mentally and even spiritually. Now, the amazing thing about Christmas is that God offers us hope. Listen to the words of the angels and the shepherds on that first Christmas morning. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace, peace to those on whom his favour rests. So Jesus Christ came at Christmas to offer us all peace. Now, first of all, Jesus Christ offers us peace with God. And it is the most important type of peace. It is spiritual peace. And can I say to us that we will never find true peace in our hearts, in our lives, until we are at peace with God. And this is because we are made by God and we are made for him. So God created us to know him and to love him and to experience him. And if we don't have this relationship with God, there will always be something missing in our lives. One student wrote this. She said, I was always searching for something, something definite, something you can rely on, someone to be with me there always. Robbie Williams, the pop singer, the rock singer, says, there's a hole in my soul. And the great tragedy today is that there are many people, and there may even be some of you here this morning, I meet people like this all the time, who are searching for life without God. Searching for love in the wrong places, searching for acceptance. Oh, that I might find peace. It's the universal cry of the human heart. Now, the barrier that separates us from God is what the Bible calls sin. Now, what is sin? It's not a word that we use today very much. A friend of mine used to ask people, what's the middle letter? I, self-centeredness. Let me give you one of the clearest definitions that I've come across uh, about what sin is. said this, we were created to live in a relationship with God, but we have rejected him, and the relationship was broken. And this rejection of God and the building of our lives around anything else is what the Bible calls sin. And we show this attitude by being selfish towards other people or openly disobeying God by simply ignoring him. So, if we are to find peace, real peace, we need to find peace with God, our creator. And the important thing is that peace does not, peace with God does not come from something that we do. Peace with God comes through what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Listen to the prophet Isaiah. He said, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We've left God's path to follow our own way. Yet the Lord, God, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, it took me a long time to realize that God didn't, that that knowing God, experiencing him, did not depend on my own efforts. It was a gift that was offered to me on the basis of what Christ had done for me. So he offers us peace with God. Secondly, he offers us peace within ourselves. And you could call this emotional peace. And uh, the Bible calls it the peace of God. Now, when I have peace with God, then I get the peace of God. And the Hebrew word, some of you will know this, for this peace is the word shalom. There are over 790 references to it in the Bible. And it is living at peace with my creator rather than in conflict with him. And once I'm at peace with my creator, I begin to find peace within. Now, what does this mean in practice? Well, let me give you a few hints. It means that God offers us his comfort 
when our hearts are broken and sad. It means that God offers us his guidance when we are confused and we don't know which way to turn. It means that God offers us forgiveness when we feel ashamed of things that we have done or said. And it also means that God can offer us confidence when we are anxious and worried. And the third and final type of peace that Jesus offers us is peace with other people. Now, this is very difficult. It's very difficult living at peace with other people. I'm sure you find this like I do. We were created to live at peace with others and not to live in conflict with them, but it's so difficult. And the further we are away from God, the more our relationships with others are messed up. So if you want to strengthen your relationships with others, with your family, often it's family members who are the most difficult to love, Or it might be your friends, even some of your friends or some of your work colleagues. If you want to strengthen these relationships, maybe some of them are, are, you're struggling with them. You need to strengthen your relationship with God. He can pull you all together. So this is the message of Christmas. Christ came to bring us peace. Peace with God. That's the most important type of peace. Peace with ourselves. Once we're at peace with God, we find the peace of God and peace with others. Now, I want to finish by giving you all an invitation this morning. Peace is an unattainable dream by ourselves, but it's a free gift from God, and this gift is available to us today. Now, can I say to you that this gift that Jesus Christ offers you, each one of you today, is is different from any other gift you will receive this Christmas. For one thing, it is the most expensive gift you'll ever receive. It's priceless. Jesus Christ paid for it with his own life. And it's also the only gift that will last forever. And it is also extremely practical It's a gift that you will use every day. So I want to ask you, are you interested? And I finish with a a story and a prayer. I was preaching one night at Cambridge University, and there were several hundred students came, and uh, I gave the talk, and I didn't feel the talk went that well. I felt it was okay, but not that good. And... um, I said at the end, at the end of the talk, I'm going to give people an opportunity. If you'd like to come to Christ, you can come to Christ with me today. And then I slipped in, but some of you think that what I've said is a load of rubbish. And I said, if you think that it was a load of rubbish, rather than going outside, come and tell me. That's fine. I'm relaxed about that. So I finished the service. I had a time of prayer, which I'm going to have with you. And then I waited, and a queue of people uh, queued up to to see me. (laughs) Uh, Some of them actually came to Christ that night. But there was one chap, and I can remember it very vividly. He was tall. He had quite a striking face, and it turned out that he was the vice president of the union. So he was a political speaker. And he looked at me and he said, I've come to tell you that what you said tonight I thought was a load of rubbish. So I said, thank you very much. That's good to hear. And then I said, what's your name? And I've never forgotten his name. He said, my name is Tom Fish. So I said, well, Tom Fish, I've got a a gospel here, a gospel of John, and I challenge you to read it five times And let me know what you think. And he looked at me and he said, I'll do that. So I went back to London. I was working in the West End of London. And you can imagine my delight when a week later I got a letter from him. I've still got it. Dear Roger, I read the Gospel of John three times and I've become a Christian. Anyway, I was so delighted about this. And uh, I forgot about Tom Fish. And then about 20 
odd years later, I was in Blackpool speaking to a bunch of clergymen and people and uh, on church growth or something. And I said at the end, look, if you've got any questions, I'd love to meet you. And at the end of the seminar, a queue of people came to see me. And then a chap uh, came up to me. He was a bit older. And uh, I, he said, do you remember me? I said, no. I said, what's your name? He said, Tom Fish. I said, oh, Tom Fish. Yes, I do. What do you do now? He said, I'm a vicar. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that if you read this, you will become a vicar. We've got enough vicars, probably. But... There might be someone here this this morning, and actually what you need to do is read a John's Gospel for yourself. Read it for yourself. And you never know. And if you read, read it with an open heart and an open mind, God could work in you in the way that he worked in Tom Fish. So would you come afterwards? I'll be standing here. And if you thought what I said is a load of rubbish, also come and see me. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray together. Now, I'm going to just say a prayer that I prayed when I first gave my life to Jesus Christ, because there may be someone here this morning who actually, you kind of know this is true, but you've never done anything about it. And I remember as an anthropology student with my heart thudding away as I sat in this church in the West End of London, and the preacher said, I'm going to say a prayer now, uh, opening up my heart to Christ. And if you'd like to pray with me, do. And then, he, and then he added, come and see me afterwards. He said, you'll have to push your way against the crowds as they leave the church. And then he added, but you might as well learn that now, because it'll be like that for the rest of your life. And so 50 years ago, I pushed my way against the crowd, and I said, I I prayed that prayer. I want to follow Jesus Christ. So here's a, a, a simple prayer you could pray, and come and see me afterwards if you do pray with me for the first time. Lord Jesus, I want to know you personally. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for going my own way instead of your way. Thank you for dying on the cross to forgive my sin. Please come and take first place in my life and make me the person you want me to be. Lord, I pray this in your name. Amen. As we approach the day of Jesus' birth, I pray we may have the gladness of Christmas, which is hope, the light of Christmas, which is faith, the spirit of Christmas, which is peace, and the heart of Christmas, which is love. Lord, we thank you for the Christmas tree with all its ornaments, some collected over many years, each with its own significance and memory. We thank you for the Christmas lights that remind us of the star that brought the wise men and shepherds to the stable. We thank you for the gifts around the Christmas tree that remind us of the gold, frankincense and myrrh they brought to the stable. But at the same time, we also remember those less fortunate. We pray today for friends and families as they gather for this special occasion. We pray for all those who will be working and who, who will be away from homes and can't be with their families this Christmas. And we think about empty places at tables where loved ones no longer sit. But, dear Lord, we pray most of all that we can rejoice in the true meaning of Christmas, the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, and how he came to give us hope, faith, peace, and love. And help us to focus on you, remembering that our most treasured Christmas present of all is the birth of your son, a gift that lasts for the whole year through, not just Christmas Day. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm bringing you good news for everyone. So in a season when everyone should be happy and light, 
Many of us are struggling with life's heavy burdens that steal the joy right out of our Christmas stocking. So we pray for those whose hearts are battered and broken and those whose lives know only conflict and confusion. I'm remembering today my friend Jason. We lift before you those who are homeless, cold and lonely. Comfort them in spirit and bless all those who work to provide them with shelter, food and friendship. Especially the charities Crisis at Christmas, Christians Against Poverty, Beeson, and we pray that no one will be lonely this Christmas. Precious Saviour, draw them close to you. Let them know you are the same person who came to save us. Yet you were born in a stable and laid in a simple manger of hay. Christ, for whom there was no room at the inn, give courage to all those who are homeless. Christ, who fled into Egypt, give hope to all refugees. Christ, who fasted in the desert, give relief to all those who are hungry. And Christ, who hung in agony on the cross, give strength to all those who suffer. At this time of year, in which you join heaven and earth together, we thank you for being with all your people in all their differing cultures and environments throughout the world. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Lord, we ask for peace and reconciliation, and we ask you to come for all those who fear tomorrow and don't know what the future will bring. As we've heard in past gospel readings of Jesus' compassion for the sick, so we pray for all those who are not well at this time, as we share a brief moment of silence together. We pray for the government, that you will inspire them to govern with wisdom and determination in the months and years ahead, and always do what is right for our nation. We pray for your servant, King Charles, fill him with your Holy Spirit, grant that his reign may be one of faithful witness, may he prove to others he is, like you, a source of hope, faith, peace and love. Lord, bless our beautiful church here in the Cotswolds, especially those who lead us each week and those who contribute to our church life and to the glory of God. Gracious Lord, as we step into Christmas, we don't know what will cross our path this coming week, but you are our rock, our fortress, our comfort and our strength. You are the hope of our journey and the light on our way. You are no longer that babe in a manger of hay. You are our Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So grant us peace, peace in our homes and villages, peace in our churches, and most of all, peace in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the greatest Christmas gift of all, the love of your Son, so that each and every one of us will have a very Merry Christmas. Amen. Amen. We say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The final reading is taken from St. John's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Jesus is the word of the Father. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. 
He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so may the joy of the angels, the gladness of the shepherds, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and those whom you love this day, this Christmas, and always. Amen. Amen.